So at this point, I want to go ahead and uh, thank Mike for uh, doing the prayers and also introduce the sermon of today that uh, Mike will be giving. And the title is Our Christian Duty. And it will be about offering guidance to be the kind of people God wants us to be. Um, he is one of two elders we have here that serve the Colorado Springs congregation. And we want to thank him for being the senior spiritual advisor and on the board for Colorado Springs Church of God's Seventh Day and serving faithfully for several years now. Um, he is also the coordinator of the Church of God's Seventh Day Montana Fellowship and uh, serves an area about the size of Ukraine. And he's been a part of Church of God since 1972. And uh, many of you know that he uh, has a number of different college degrees and is a lifelong learner. That's how I put it. And, uh, and a historian, he um, has studied with um, RDO's college in their theology, theology degree program and is on the Dean's list with a 4.0. And he also has a bachelor's degree in theology as well as a um, bachelor's, a bachelor's as well as an associate's degree. And he and Bonnie live in Florence, Montana, and have been married for 43 years. They have five children and six grandchildren. He's been in insurance since 1986 and owns his own insurance agency. And uh, he raises sheep and he's got a horse and uh, maybe two. <laughs> and uh, we, with no further ado, uh, Mike Wallace, our Christian duty. Oh, and if I could ask everybody to turn off their camera as I will do, I think everyone's already done it. So here I go. Thank you, Heidi, for that introduction. I uh, appreciate that. <clears throat> it's been an interesting summer here, very, very fast in Montana. Uh, it rained and rained quite a bit through spring and early summer. Bonnie went away for a month and now we're we're moving into fall already and it's like, where did where did summer go we live in the bitterroot valley which the salish indians used to call what i think would be translating into the valley of smoke uh, august september often very smoky years and uh, it's it makes it a little difficult because you get smoked in it's like living in a campfire and we've only had that for about a week now but it's already starting to clear up which is great. Um, it'll help my lungs quite a bit. I know this last week I, I came home early from work one day, then the next day I kind of had a headache from it. So, but it's it's clear enough. So let's get started today. I want to get into an interesting subject here, something that's it's been on my mind for a while. And before we go, we're going to pray about it because it's in a very very important subject for all of us father we come before you and we thank you for calling us out of this world we're in the world but we're in you we're in your body and our little church is here we're doing what needs to be done to follow you and that's really what counts we ask for a blessing on these services and open our minds and eyes and help us all to do what's right in your eyes Appreciate this and pray this through Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Many of us have heard of Douglas MacArthur, probably one of the greatest generals of all time. Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, a number of them. But he would be ranked as one of the best generals of all times. He graduated from West Point about 1903. And in only 15 years, he was appointed a brigadier general, very quick. Eventually, he rose to chief of staff of the United States Army. And then in 1937, after a long and distinguished career, he retired, 34 years of service to his country. 1937, it wasn't long and he was recalled to active duty and assigned the Pacific Theater during the World War II. After the eventual surrender of Japan, he became the Allied Supreme Commander and the de facto ruler of Japan. In a way, he was their new emperor for a while. He served as general and leader of the United Nations forces in Korea 
until his dismissal in 1951. General Douglas MacArthur had served his country for 48 years, a very, very long time. On May the 12th, 1962, he spoke at the military academy, the distinguished and aged general of the United States Army, one of the greatest generals we ever had, was accepting the Sylvanus Thayer Award. I want to quote from his speech. I want us to listen carefully to his words because they apply to us in many, many ways. General MacArthur said, quote, no human being could fail to be deeply moved by such a tribute as this. Coming from a profession I have served so long and a people I have loved so well. It fills me with an emotion I cannot express. But this award is not intended primarily to honor a personality, but to symbolize a great moral code, a code of conduct and chivalry of those who guard this beloved land of culture and ancient descent. For all hours and for all time, it is an expression of the ethics of the American soldier that I should be integrated in this way with so noble an idea arouses a sense of pride and yet humility, which will be with me always. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. They are our rallying point to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn." End quote. General MacArthur served his country United States of America with duty and honor. He put country first. Today, I want to talk about our Christian duty. What is our Christian duty and who is our allegiance to? For those of you on the call, you should have received in an email with these sermon notes if you would like to pull that up and follow along. Let's talk about our Christian duty. General MacArthur, he knew his duty to the American people. Do we know our Christian duty? Are we able to serve Jesus, Jesus with duty, honor, and country? What is our Christian duty? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. This was mentioned this morning in the Bible study concerning the church. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We, the members of the body of Christ, whether part of the Colorado Springs Congregation, Church of God Seventh Day, the widows and orphans around the world that Brian Baker so diligently serves, the international church that Brian Clayton so diligently serves, our cousin church of gods out there, the body of Christ. We are ambassadors. And as ambassadors, we represent Jesus Christ. How do we do that? What is our duty in representing Jesus Christ? We are ambassadors of his kingdom. We are a, of a higher calling. We have our Christian duty to perform for our leader, Jesus. Philippians 3 and verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a citizenship, not of this physical world. We have a loyalty, not of this physical world. We have a citizenship. And we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ being our monarch. Our allegiance is above this world. Our duty is to Christ and his church. You know, 
we lost a marvelous person this week in Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. An amazing woman, 70 plus years on the throne of England, serving and giving, serving and giving. I was reading this morning, there was a statement attributed to her where somebody that she counseled with said she did not fear death. And when I asked why, she said, because when I die, I can lay my crown at the feet of Jesus Christ because he is the king. What a marvelous lady. So how do we perform our Christian duty? five points I would like to go over this morning. How do we perform our Christian duty? Honor country. First, let's turn to the book of John. Talk about love for a minute. The first point is love. We ever thought of a definition of love? Love is unselfish, outgoing concern. It's not just outgoing concern. You can have outgoing concerns for the wrong reasons. Love is unselfish, unselfish, outgoing concern. <clears throat> and on his last night of life, in John chapter 13, verse, well, let's start in 33. John 13, 33. What did Jesus have to say on his last night of life about love? Little children, that's us. I shall be with you. A little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, and we show it, and people know it because of the love we have one for another. Love is unselfish, outgoing concern. It's not prideful. It's not hurtful. Love entails forgiveness and is shown by the fruits of the Spirit. Loving one another shows our Christianity. Let's turn to Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Have you got the notes pulled up? You're probably already there. Psalms 103 in just one verse. Verse 12. As far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Part of love is forgiveness. Forgiving each other because we are human. That came out in Bible study this morning. It's interesting how it was already in the sermon notes. <clears throat> God removes our transgressions as far as the east from the west. He forgets them. He forgets and he forgives our sins when we ask for repentance. This is the mind of Christ. This is part of loving each other. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. The author of Hebrews is the one who invented coffee because he got up every morning and he brewed some coffee. So there we go. Hebrews chapter 12. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Jesus Christ will be merciful when we make errors and he will remember them no more. This is part of love. This is part of Christianity, of how we treat each other, of how the world should be treated. Galatians chapter 5, another part of love is God's fruit of the Spirit. This 
the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 show us what happens when God's love is in us, when God's love is exuding from us, when we are his ambassador, when we are his citizenship. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, that unselfish, outgoing concern, joy, that unbridled happiness, and that we have been saved from the penalty of death, that we are happy, that we know that Jesus Christ is coming, the peace, the patience, the long-suffering, the kindness to each other, the giving to each other, the loving of each other goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. There's no law against God's love and spirit. These fruits of the spirit show love. And in verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Our pride. Let's not have pride. Let's have love, that unselfish, outgoing concern, that forgiveness of each other. Jesus Christ, in John 13, on his last night, spoke. The world would know us. We know his family his Christians, by how they love each other. Point number one is love. Point number two, let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Point number two, keeping God's commandments. All 10 of them. I remember Charlton has to get up at MGM Studios and all the sound and they're getting up and they says, the nine commandments. Nope, it was 10, still is 10. A fourth commandment, the Sabbath day, is still there. Mark chapter 10, 17 to 21. This is where the young wealthy man comes to Jesus. And he says, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? First, he thought he had to earn it. No. Grace is God giving us his salvation. That doesn't mean we don't keep the commandments, but we can only be saved by grace through faith that Jesus Christ will perform the good works. And Jesus says to him, well, wait, 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 wait. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Jesus puts it right back to the Father. You know, we're going through the, the Sermon on the Mount, and we just reached in Matthew 6 the Lord's Prayer. How did Jesus start that? Who was first? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God first. What did Jesus do here? God in the flesh says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He gave a summary of the Ten Commandments. And the young man, he says, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said, one thing you lack. So keeping the commandments did not get him into the kingdom of God. One thing you lack. Go your way. So whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. It was more than law giving. It was from the heart. But as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, remember the Beatitudes? Let me go back there. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers, all of these things. The young man was sad and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He put his possessions ahead of God. 
John chapter 14. John chapter 14 concerning the commandments. John 14, verse 15. Red letter in my Bible said by Jesus Christ, if you love me, keep my commandments. All 10 of them. 1 John 5 and verse 3. 1 John 5 and verse 3. It's interesting how many people proclaim Christianity but throw the commandments of God out. I'm saved by grace, so you can do what you want. Oh, no, I have to. Then they put their own words in. We don't have to put our own words in. This is what John said, the best friend of Jesus. We just read where Jesus said, keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 3, Jesus' best friend, the last living apostle, as far as we know, 60 years plus after the death of Christ, what does John say? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Point number two, we keep the commandments of God. Love keep the commandments. Now turn over to Matthew 22. Point number three is not redundant. It just might seem like it at first, but it's a very, very important point. Matthew 22. Point number three is love God and love man. Love God and love man we learn a very, very important principle about our duty in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. They asked him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You see, like in the Lord's Prayer, like to the rich young gentleman, he put God first. He put his father first. And frankly, when we put God first every day, 24-7, 365, at all times, it becomes very difficult to sin. I was reading in the Bible Advocate this morning a, a wonderful article some folks had gone to a wedding, and at the wedding, they had a Polaroid camera. This was recent, and everybody in the guest line to sign the guest book stood there. They took a Polaroid picture, and then they handed it to them. And the picture, remember how they worked? They would slowly develop. You could see an outline, and then it was fuzzy, and then it was dotted, and then it would finally at the end, you had this crisp, clear picture. He used this as an analogy of our walk with God, how we begin and we're learning that picture is taken. We're supposed to be like God. We're supposed to put God first. And as we live our lives, we learn more. We Bible study, we go to church, we go to Bible study, we fellowship, we love each other, we do these things. And the picture of our Christianity is developing. We're getting clearer and clearer and more like God every day. So Jesus said, what is a great commandment? Number one, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. See, they asked him, what's the great commandment? He gave them two. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first one, the first four commandments, love God with all your heart. Have no other gods before me. Don't make any, any graven images. Don't use God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The second one about loving your neighbor, honor your mother and father. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't lie. He summarized the commandments here. My good friend, Heidi as mentioned many times to me and probably to others. 
the importance of not flipping these commandments. Do not flip these commandments. Do not love God first. Excuse me. Do not love man first and God second. This is the correct order. God first. In everything Jesus said, I can only do what God has told me to do. Our Father who art in heaven. Why do you call me good? There is none good but God in heaven. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart first. God first, God first, God first, God first, man second. When you flip these commandments, what happens? Well, we might have a friend. We might have a pastor. We might have a church leader who we follow. And when they get off track and leave the church, people follow them. I've seen that happen a number of times. You get a very flamboyant, a very serving, a very wonderful pastor who gets a following. And what happens? When he leaves, people leave with him. They have flipped the commandment of God. God first, man second. Point number four, do good to the household of saints. Do good to the household of saints. As Christians, they will know us by how we love each other. Our duty, our honor, our country is our kingdom. Our body of Christ in James 1.27. James, the brother of Jesus Christ, writes the following. James, by the way, may have been the first epistle written. There are uh, several sources out there that say James possibly was written between 40 and 45 AD, just 10 to 15 years, 10 to 12 years after the death of Jesus. Amazing history behind that. We'll get to it in our Tuesday Bible study. Once we're done with Matthew, we're going to be going to the epistles, both James, I mean, both Paul and all the epistles through them in the order they were written. But verse 27 of chapter one, our duty, our honor, our Christian duty. James says, pure and undefiled religion, pure, no imperfections, perfect religion, undefiled religion before God and the Father, there's God again, is this to visit orphans, and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I wrote this last week, my Wednesday Bible blurb. I had another Bible blurb mostly written. I stayed up fairly late on Tuesday, got up Wednesday morning and wrote a brand new one. When I read from Brian Baker, I think I have one of them here. Yep, there it is. Most recent one, yeah, August 2022, The Changed. He puts this out. I read that. And I have to talk about that. I have to talk about the orphans and the widows. We have members of the family of Christ, of the body of Christ, who daily suffer. We have our trials. There's trials to wealth. There's trials to living in a country where we can have anything we want. Yet our members live in countries where they are jailed. They are slaves. They are not allowed to eat. They don't have medical care. They don't have the food. They are slaughtered. They are massacred. They are hunted down and killed. Brian Baker documents it for us. Pure an undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. How do we stay unspotted from the world? Very simple. Put God first. Do not flip the commandments. God the Father in Jesus Christ, every second, every moment, 24-7, 365 and even on leap year. Put God first. 
take care of the orphans and the widows, take care of our extended family across the seas, take care of each other, be loving and kind, forgiving each other, do the things that God wants us to do. Turn to Galatians chapter six. The apostle Paul is writing in Galatians six, <clears throat> verse 10. I'm going to start in verse six, Galatians six. I'm just going to back up to verse six. Let him who was taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. We had this discussion during the Bible study with Merwin leading about, and it was brought up with elders. What do elders do and how do they act? And we all need your help. But here's the thing. Let him who was taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. All of us are responsible for the word. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh, the flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't get weary of being kind to people, of showing that unselfish, outgoing concern. And in verse 10 of Galatians 6, he says, therefore, because I've made these statements, therefore, I've made these statements, therefore, do this. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That verse hits me every time when I look at these magazines Brian Baker puts out. When I get notes and comments and calls and discussions with people, the hard life we live, the pains and the aches of Christianity of daily life. These verses are for us. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. What a wonderful thing. Point number five, Mark chapter one, verse 14. Every one of these points could be expanded upon, points could be added, just trying to hit highlights today. Point number five, our duty is to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is what we have been called to do. Preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, Mark writes, Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. It's the first thing Jesus Christ taught and preached, the kingdom of God, the kingdom within us by his spirit, the physical kingdom that he's coming at his return, and the eternal kingdom when he turns the keys of the kingdom over to his father once everything has been cleansed, the kingdom of God. It's what Jesus Christ preached, Matthew 6, 33. It's what he preached, what he wants us to preach. What's our job? But seek first. First, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do not forget his righteousness. Ten commandments, loving each other, love God with all your heart, love man with all your heart, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We preach and we teach the kingdom of God. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, familiar verses, I hope. I'll start in 18 of Matthew 28. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Just like the king. 
We now have a new king, King Charles III. Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and all authority. He holds the heavens together. He keeps the universe functioning. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything. All authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Therefore, you and me, the earlier disciples, the future, he says, go. You know, that, that's an action word. Get up and do something. We go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We thought about that. Our Christian duty is to go, to get up and do what we have been taught. How do we do that? For some folks, they are in a stage of life where praying is their duty. Most of us can still physically go. We can talk to people. We can live our lives. We have some neighbors, Bonnie was reminding me last night who uh, we get along with very, very well. But he made a joke one day. So sometimes we want to be away from you guys because we want to really goof up, so to speak. And around you guys, you know, you're Christians. We've got to be. They've noticed. That's a very good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. They've noticed. I like that. I'm glad they noticed. They should notice all of us. We have love. We keep his commandments. We love God and love man, and we do not flip those. We do good to the household of saints. We preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Our Christian duty consists of loving each other, which includes forgiveness to each other and the fruits of the Spirit. Keeping his commandments, loving God first and mankind second. Doing good to all, particularly the brethren, and we are commissioned like an officer in the army, like General MacArthur, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. We have a commission. We go. We have a little church in Colorado Springs right now. It is time for all of us to stand up, to support, and to go do the right thing. Our little church is on 4th and 13, and time is running out. Stand up. Fight for the church. Keep us together in that building so we can go and preach the gospel and help bring people to Christ with God's will. As Christians, we have our tough days. Sometimes our emotions rise and fall. Sometimes we get in arguments. Sometimes we just have a bad day. Sometimes we're hurt. Sometimes the smoke gets to you. You don't feel well. We'll all sin and fall off the ladder at times. Good days and bad. But as Christians, we know our duty. Peter, 1 Peter 3, 15. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. He says, but, quoting him, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. See, God first. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, end quote. Can we personally give a defense for our faith in Jesus Christ and his salvation? General MacArthur gave a defense for this country. Can we as citizens of heaven, as ambassadors for Jesus Christ, give a proper defense for the hope that lies within us. I want to mention another great American, President Theodore Roosevelt. He gave an account of his life, a remarkable individual who suffered many health issues and fought and overcame them, became a president of the United States. I have one of his, I have, actually I have a number of his books, uh, some very good books too. 
I would like to quote from Theodore Roosevelt and something he had to say, because it is critical for our Christian duty when we see what he thought his duty was. Quoting President Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out where the strong stumble or how the doer could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is in the arena, his face marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and falls short again and again. There is no effort without error. But he who tries, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, at best knows the triumph of achievement and at worst fails while daring. His place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. President Theodore Roosevelt, end quote effort, getting out there and doing our duty. It is the Christian in the arena. Reminds me of the Colosseum and the lions and our early forefathers being killed for the enjoyment of the Caesars. It is the Christian in the arena who the credit belongs to, not to the one standing on the sideline pointing out the Christian's faults our faces marred by the dust of the devil and the hatred of many, but it is the Christian who tries when faced with the lion in the arena, who knows the great enthusiasm of conversion and great devotions, who spends his time in the worthy cause of kingdom preaching. The Christian who falls short and gets up again to face another day in this world ruled by Satan. The Christian who has the sweat of blood of Christ written all over him, who strives valiantly, who errs and falls short again and again. It is the Christian who will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. It is our duty, our honor, our country, our love, our keeping of the commandments, our loving God and man, are loving and doing the good to the household of the saints of preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. These are our Christian duties. Now, let's go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Father, we come before you contemplating what you have called us to do and what you've called us to be that love, that unselfish, outgoing concern, the keeping of your commandments, the loving you first and man second, and taking care of orphans and widows and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, that we have been commissioned as part of your army, that we are citizenships and we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God, that we are the Christian in the arena that must get up and go do our Christian duties. We pray for your guidance. We pray for our inspiration that you watch over and help us all to do what you want us to do, to do the needs of your church, to help each other, to support the orphans and the widows around this world. Help us to see your will and your way of life. Help us to simply go preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. We ask you for this, and we thank you for all of this. Through our Savior, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Stop the recording. <laughs>